What you're looking at is Pete. It doesn't look very important, but it is. Now you want to ban people in rural communities, in my communities, my neighbour, from being able to purchase, purchase a load of turf come September, and they don't have any other source of heating. They don't have any other source of heat. Peat, called turf by the Irish, is accumulated organic matter that isn't fully decomposed. It forms in waterlogged, oxygen-poor conditions when plants die without the fungi and bacteria needed to decompose them. The places where peat builds up are called bogs, taking its root from the old Irish word bogach, meaning soft ground. And it's in Ireland where you can find bogs like nowhere else. It's one of the boggiest European countries that exists. And the rural traditions and history are also one of a kind. The earliest account of peat harvesting is traced back to Pliny the Elder and his work, The Natural History. In it, he describes a group of Germanic people near the North Sea coast of Germany who form mud with their hands, which, when dried in the wind rather than in the sun, is burned to cook their food and warm their bodies chilled by the cold north wind. Peat, you see, has multiple uses, the ones to remember fuel, agriculture, and forestry. In Ireland, it's the first that has had the largest consequences, the destruction of thousands of hectares of bog. Historically, many poor rural Irish families would return to the same bog yearly. They would be given turbary rights, the right to dig, cut, carry, and take away turf. There, they'd collect the bricks of fuel, a slow-burning, earthy substance that would heat their small homes, homes built in the same material. Peat is a good insulator, not merely a fuel. To harvest the fuel, peat farmers would begin with cutting away the dense plant material and heather at the top of the bog. And once they reached a sufficient depth, they would slice off the peat with a tool called a slain, schlan, which could also vary significantly by region and country. Slains usually consisted of an iron head and wooden shaft, the head flat and often featuring a wing, which allows farmers to twist the peat into roughly formed briquettes, which makes for easier loading onto a barrow. The farmers would then bring peat to a spreading ground where they would arrange the peat in stooks, small tipped over towers that would let the wind pass through them so that the sods could dry evenly. But no bog is the same. In the polar regions of Europe, you can find the Palsa bog, a bog with a permanently frozen core of peat distributed across the Nordics and common in Finland. Also located in Fennoscandia, you can find the Appa bog, which is unique for its concave and string flark patterns. But we're focused on Ireland because it's the raised bog that we're the most interested in. Raised bogs occur in regions with high effective humidity and with a high level of precipitation, narrowing its scope to Ireland, England, Western Norway, the Netherlands, and Northwestern Germany. Although Ireland has unique blanket bogs due to a much higher level of precipitation on average, raised bogs are still the most important. They're ancient pieces of land that host some of the oldest ecosystems in Europe. It's Ireland that holds the largest percentage of Europe's active raised bogs. And to understand why Ireland does, but its other European counterparts do not, requires us to move across the English Channel to the Netherlands, where I promise I did not intend to go, but it's necessary for the explanation. Because where Ireland's raised bogs still survive, severely wounded, in the Netherlands, they're practically dead. The Dutch used to have one of the largest raised bogs in Europe, but mass reclamation in the 1700s resulted in its destruction. Peat is a heavy material, so the value of it as a fuel source had to be considered against transportation costs. And because the Netherlands had intricate knowledge of water transportation, the cost of moving peat wasn't really a relevant factor. But for the Irish, it started decades, nearly a century later. The Irish were a rural population that was much more sparsely populated and self-sufficient, also a product of the bog, no boats. Peat presents problems, it's highly acidic, which is an obstacle for agriculture, and it's spongy, which hinders transportation and communication. That is until a great development. The potato. It seems like a boring root vegetable. Root vegetable maybe, but boring not at all. It is high nutritional value, can be produced quickly, requires little land, and can grow in harsh environments. The most important detail. 
It originated from the Andes, and it came to Ireland in the late 1500s, and like no other European country, the potato dominated Ireland. It was able to grow quickly in Ireland's harsh, moist, acidic, boggy soil, and required less labor, which created a perfect storm that meant that the Irish population grew faster than its continental counterparts. And that increasing Irish population put an increasing pressure on the demand for energy. The potato, combined with a bunch of other important factors, meant that the rise of peat in Ireland truly began. But a demand for peat meant a supply of other things. Bogs are carbon sinks. If plants don't decompose, they don't release carbon dioxide. And extracting valuable resources from bogs means you must drain it, cut through the bog, and you get rid of the waterlogged conditions that made the environment possible in the first place. Undecomposed plants turn into decomposing ones, releasing carbon that would have otherwise been stored. And then there's also the little detail that burnt peat is carcinogenic. But there's another thing that is lost, though much more difficult to quantify. A remarkable ecosystem. Plants require nutrients, substances used by organisms to survive, grow, and reproduce. They require carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, which they can get through the atmosphere and soil. But getting other nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus, can be a more complicated endeavor, especially so in the bog. Mycorrhizae, plants in the bog will form a symbiotic relationship with fungi. In exchange for carbohydrates, the plants obtain valuable nutrients like phosphorus. Or swap out the fungi for bacteria. Furs, a common Irish legume, has a symbiotic relationship with rhizobia, a bacteria that infects the plant's roots that causes nodules to form. In these nodules, nitrogen gas can be processed into an actual useful compound. But furs has even more interesting properties. It doesn't only form a symbiotic relationship with bacteria, but it forms a symbiotic relationship with ants. Its seeds come equipped with an eliosome, a rich, fatty substance that attracts ants to move it back to their nests. And then there are the insectivores, a product of the acidic conditions in the bog. Sundews, butterworts, bladderworts, and pitcher plants each using their own specific strategies to capture prey, be it sticky tentacles or intricate aquatic valves that suck in prey in 10 to 15 thousandths of a second. But it doesn't stop there. Sphagnum is a name of a genus of mosses that develop in Irish bogs. A single plant can hold up to 20 times their own weight in water, which is massive, and it's also the reason that it was used in bandages to soak up blood. It's sphagnum that is able to grow on top of itself, compressing and causing the development of peat, it's not just any plant, it's a bog builder, helping produce incredible ecosystems, most of which are now practically destroyed. In the 1990s, the EU passed conservation directives that produced one network of protected European habitats. Natura 2000 to protect threatened species and habitats and to promote respectful tourism, forestry, sustainable agriculture and fisheries all over Europe. It directed member states to establish special protection areas within their own borders for conservation. And in Ireland, that was the bog. But protecting them was difficult. Turf cutters in the West say they're prepared to go to jail rather than abide by new EU rules. Today, they've entered their fury in Galway. It is the equivalent of the state saying to me, I'm going to take your kids off you and giving them to a lunatic. They're not getting my bob no more than they're ever getting my children. The message could not have been clearer. Despite a blanket ban on turf cutting at 53 raised bogs in the West and Midlands, turf cutting will continue. No, what you're watching burn is actually the outcome of farmers' protests in the Netherlands, also caused in part by Natura. There's an anger there that's very similar to the anger surrounding peat in Ireland. An environment being harmed, difficult costs that now have to be paid, and wouldn't you know, people getting upset about what the right rules are. It's a consultation. That is not, no, 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 that is not what Minister Ryan said. He came out he's and made accepted, He's accepted that the- Peat isn't just a clump of dirt. It represents a simple question, as much Irish as it is European. How do you make the right decision regarding scarce public land in Europe, together? That's an answer I can't give you, because I don't even know how to do the dishes properly. But there are some people that I think can help. 80,000 hours. 
It's the amount of time in your life that you'll spend working, and it's the name of the nonprofit that wants to make sure that work is meaningful. When you spend days of your life looking at an Excel sheet with the sole purpose of maximizing business metrics in a company you're not truly interested in, it's very rational to ask yourself, what am I doing? A meaningful life is a function of the outcome of my actions, but my outcomes are producing superficial PowerPoints, not a life that gets me excited. I'd like to be solving useful problems, like Pete in Ireland, but I don't know how and where to start. Well, luckily, 80,000 Hours is here to help solve your problem. It helps you find high-impact careers so that you can help contribute to solving some of the world's most pressing problems, be it through helping you find a research position, an internship at a government program, and or helping you solve the question of AI safety, a position my brother and I have both considered pursuing through 80,000 hours before they even approach me to sponsor them. Don't forget, life is short. Your time is something you'll never get back. But what you do with that time is completely up to you. Please check out their in-depth career guide at 80,000hours.org slash hoch. Remember, it's a non-profit. Their services are free. Thank you for watching.